back, folks, to the WWP Tonic Round Table Show. This is episode 402. We do this show at 8.30 Pacific AM Pacific Standard Time. I've got a small but opinionated and powerful panel here. I'm gonna let my um, I'm gonna let Spencer introduce himself to the new listeners and viewers first. Go on, Spencer. Sure, Spencer Foreman from WPLauncherFi.com. Thank you, Spencer. And I've got my great friend John Locke. Would you like to introduce yourself, John? John Locke from Lockdown seo.com and we've got a great special guest he reckons he's got opinions we'll, yeah, we'll, that's it. We'll, we'll soon find out won't we listeners of yours and that's Vito Peleg would you like to introduce yourself yeah sure so I'm Vito uh, from WP Feedback and um, yeah all right sweet but to the point yes yeah, staying um, in the same frame as the, as the guys yes they look a bit tired but we're soon warm yeah. them up um before we go into the great stories that i've selected <laughs> oh god uh we're going to talk about one of our great sponsors and i like to talk about wp fusion and what is wp fusion well in your technology stack of 2019 there's definitely two things that you need that's wordpress and you need a crm and your CRM needs to communicate to WordPress flawlessly and be given special powers. And that's what WP Fusion is. It's the thing that gives these two great technologies, gives you special powers, especially if you've got a membership or a learning management or you're into WooCommerce and you want to do all those amazing auto automatic automization with your marketing, which is a great buzzword of 2019 as well. So if that sounds interesting, then it should go to WP Fusion's website and they've offered you, beloved listeners and viewers, a special deal. If you go and look around and go and look at any of their packages with the coupon code WPTONIC, all uppercase, again, WPTONIC, you'll get 25% off any of the packages. And that's only exclusively offered by WPTONIC and WP Fusion. So I can't recommend it more. I use it myself. Um, go and find more. Now, on to the first story. The first story is Joyce DeVolk steps down as WordPress marketing lead. What do you reckon, Spencer? I love the, the sort of I told you so slash we saw where this was going aspect of the story. It's this bloody train wreck, you reckon, do you? I, you know, I don't, I don't wish any ill will, but I mean, first of all, uh, you know, Yoast is really approaching this in a very like realistic way, especially because we talked many, many months ago about his own little drama with the whole thing going on at the, his events and all the, you know. Settlets, he's little settlets. That he's part all that of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Con considering he, he, he went to the mountain, he climbed up, he spoke he fell, he fell, he fell off. And then he found out that there was no great wisdom there, like everybody's been talking. And he walked back down the mountain and said, eh, I'm going back to my day job, which is really the bottom line. And then I love the comments, because remember, whenever we talk about WP Tavern. We well, did like my comment. I left a comment on his. Uh... I, didn't, I, didn't, I just saw, you know, there's Jeff Chandler and Matthias. And now fifth, fourth comment is from the great guru himself, who says, thank you very much for seeing Great, Zim great Zim Zim master. You know. Uh, you will be looking for someone else to have come to the mountain. So, you know, what news is there? Other than a little schadenfreude or whatever, you know. Yeah, I, I, put, uh, I, I put a post on, on his, um, you know, I commented on the post, and he removed it. He, he took it off, and I thought I was very nice to him, but don't, no, wipe it off. I don't think. I don't think my interview of his wife, I thought I was very respectful to her, but I don't think it went down too well. I'm not in these good books. Uh, you know, the, 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 that, I mean, my last comment is that we've heard here many times, because again, I impose upon certain of your show guests my belief system of what. So we've recently heard from Triple J. We've heard from, of course, uh, you know, regular guest panelists that, all is not as it appears. So one would think that there's some like higher level of philosophical, you know, direction being handed down. But in fact, it's sort of like circa 2006, 
except that it's just automatic wrapped around Matt in his dorm room, you know, 16 years later. Like, I don't know. I'll let you know when I figure it out. Yeah, there you go. What do you reckon, John? <sighs> you Go know, on, John. So, go on. Give it, yeah. give, it, give it what you're ready for. Okay, but. so for the past year, and, and this might surprise a lot of people, there is, there is a lot of people on the tavern and there's a lot of people on, on uh, Yost's page that are like, well wishes, you know, best of, best of luck. You did good. Matt did you wrong. Matt did you dirty. And there's a lot of people that, that will basically kiss up to, to anybody who's some sort of person of power in the WordPress system. I don't know how else to say it, but if you look really closely, look past the... Um, you know, the podcast circuit and the, the word camp circuit and the Cabo press circuit and all these different little areas, you'll see that there's a growing number of people who run agencies and, and are, are big players and people who run small web design agencies and they're, they're getting fed up with, with Yoast's antics. Now for some people, it was the attachment bug uh, last year that went unreported for six months for no, some people go down too well did it no and for some people it was the seo Oktoberfest. uh you know that that him and his buddy marcus tandler who runs right uh you know all that but for me the biggest thing was the way that he disrespected his so-called friend bridget willard who's he was a friend of mine she's a friend of the show and the way that he did her dirty uh, was he stepped over her like Alan Iverson stepped over Tyron Liu in, t- in the 2001 finals in order to get this job. He didn't try and talk Matt Mullenweg out of it and say, like, Bridget is, you know, good for this job. She's already been doing this job for two years. Why don't you put her in this new position that you're creating? Uh, instead, he went behind her back, uh, him and, uh, you know, Matt and everybody, did whoever was involved, went behind her back. Uh, she found out, uh, you know, on social media, nobody told her and, you know, she ended up leaving because like, why stay somewhere where you're not respected? Um, and he quit five and a half months later. And I don't, who knows what the real story is. We'll probably never know. There's only, you know, three people that will really know Matt. Well, we all, we all, we all, we all do, you know, we can only make assumptions. Speculation. We, yeah. My speculation, my speculation is, is whatever Matt promised him, whether that was power or, you know, whatever the position was supposed to be or whatever, whatever it was, whatever he was promised, he didn't get it. But I, I know that it's really fishy that somebody would step down from their CEO job at the mil- at a multi-million dollar company to take on a, a job that, that is a volunteer position. At, well, know, can, I, can I tell you no the truth? Reason. Can I tell you the truth? The audience I don't get yeah. why was it even a volunteer position in the first place? Such yeah, exactly. exactly. I, think, I think they promised that he would be able to actually implement his ideas. And what he found was it was just a crickets. He, in other words, was given a title with no actual authority or any direction or any ability to speak publicly. And I mean, there's a hint in his actual writing that he was forced into an untenable position where he wasn't really representing his own company anymore because he had one foot in the automatic world, but yet he wasn't given any power to direct the automatic progress. He was just taking like things that fell from the sky randomly. And so right. that's a position nobody would want to be in. And I don't blame him for stepping out of it because it sounds like he basically said, you know, put up or shut up already. And they like, there's nothing to give you. So he's like, all right. Yeah, yeah bye, but bye. It, it was never going to really work out really. You know, we're, we're dealing with two men that got pretty big egos. Obviously, Matt, I, I place Matt intellectually in a slightly higher plane than Yoast. You know, I'm sorry, but I might be being a bit of a snob there. But um, um, I just do, I think... Matt for all his peculiarities and intrinsities. He's one of the smartest guys I've met. Um, but, um, it, you know, can you imagine those two egos? You know, I, I thought, yeah, I can see this last time. Sorry, I interrupted our beloved guest. Will you continue? <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I agree with you. Like, it, it, there's, there, 
there should have been some kind of a clash between those two personalities. But I think that's a good thing, especially when you're talking about leadership positions, uh, having different opinions brought onto the table from, you know, people that kind of experience things in a different perspective is the right thing to do. But when you don't get the power, I don't even mean the, 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 the kind of like the power to execute. Um, I I'm, I'm just want to bring it back to that voluntarily kind of position because that frames the entire thing as a kind of a write-off. Because if you're going to bring in someone of this caliber to do something this important within any company, no matter what company it's going to be, uh, you can't expect them to bring in the full-on expertise and you can't expect others that are getting paid to take them seriously if they're just coming in as a, as a pro bono uh, consultant. Uh, so, so they they could have done it like properly, and uh, I think that if he would have got, if they, if they would have paid him, they would maybe had felt this kind of uh, need to uh, to actually listen. You guys know that Paul, that Paul Rand job, Steve Jobs classic story, right? Which is kind of a corollary to this, where Jobs wanted Rand to design the next logo. I don't know, it was like a lot of money, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then yeah. Jobs tried to micromanage the hell out of it. And Rand was big, like, big surprise. It was a surprise. You, understand. you pay me the money because right. I'm the expert. I give you my results, use it or don't use it. But that's it. Now, the problem here, of course, automatic apparently pays no money to anybody. And then even though they get him for the title and the expertise, they don't use it. So it's sort of like the what if kind of a scenario. And it's amusing. I, I can't imagine how anybody and I just, I have a lot of clients. I just got done with a client that we were still working with them. It has like a hundred layers of bureaucracy where one person would work. But anytime you've got a scenario where either there's so many layers of bureaucracy or it's completely like a dictatorship, either one of those cannot possibly work when there's other people in that organization. It's just right. impossible. It's either an entrepreneur or it's a really well-balanced organization. And this is neither one. It's just Yeah, well, you say that. I don't think it can work if the other people are, are not bum lickers, let's face it. But for, for all his um, full balls, Yoast, I don't think he's a, I don't think he's a well, bum. He's very you know? entrepreneurial, that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, he, but I think my, a lot of the other people in um, Automatic come across as a bit bum lickish, don't they? You know, they just do what Matt wants, you know, and they just kind of lick up next to him. A lot of them is because they couldn't get a better paid job anywhere else, so they just do whatever they want, you know, they... Yes, just Matt, to, I'll do whatever. Just look I'll to be no, you can do whatever you like. To right. me, so. just look, look to Washington, D.C. if you want to see how this <laughs> works. You know, whatever you want, Matt, we'll do it. You know, Otto will come out and start, you know, start cutting and be yeah. nasty to people. You know, whatever you want, Matt, I'll do it. You know, you know but there we go. <laughs> I don't know. Can you imagine? You know, I, would last, I would last about 10 seconds in automatic when I... Uncle Spencer. The thing I always discuss and argue, and there's an article if we replace the the one about the, the the Apple app, was about another kind of similar situation where I think in today's world, you know, there's cycles to everything. And I think in today's world, we've really seen that like things that in the past weren't so important have become important again. One of them is the difference between an, entrepre an entrepreneurial mindset with skills versus following a path or a corporate ladder that somebody in the past has laid out that was successful. And in the same way, like this other article is talking about, other than like Gary Vaynerchuk, like work harder, more people are coming to like work less and enjoy life first. So I think we see cycles, things go up, they come down. And I would say right now I'm arguing for the fact that people in the WordPress ecosystem can find a lot of success dealing one-to-one -one with people at a more relaxed pace on a more personal level. And that this kind of reflects itself in this thinking because I don't know where automatic is going or where they want to go, but I think they have to shit or get off the pot on what kind of company is it? Is it an entrepreneurial group of hippies drinking Kool-Aid and all hanging out on the commune like it was, or is it a real corporation? So start hiring people for real jobs, give them real power to do real things. And let's get on with it, because this is like reminding me of our four-month Gutenberg lead-up, you know. Oh, God, the whole fall of oh, God, it was that. I was, just, I was sick of talking about it on this show, and I was, <laughs> I was sick of it. None of it having any effect on anything anymore, of course. But <laughs> Let's go on to the next story. Right, um, I thought this was a good one. As antitrust 
case against Google kicks off. Here's where the DOJ should start. So, beloved guest panelist, what did you think of this one? I studied in law school uh, for the moot court. We did, oh, he hasn't heard me. We Vito. did the, we oh, did the but... trust the stuff. Oh. And what oh. we learned was like the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act were from the railroad baron era, right? When these, <laughs> these guys effectively owned all the railroads in America, all the, the steel manufacturing, all the you know, oil and other things. And what they found is that essentially there were laws that needed to be written to prevent the exact same kind of thing that's happening here. However, you add to this the complexity of it would have been one thing to know you can't ship your goods across the country on a train. It's another thing to realize that, like, we really do live in a world where Google or Amazon or maybe Apple for some people still, I mean, they are so deeply ingrained into everything that you do that there's no aspect of your really daily lives that escape it. So I don't know if it's a clear answer is written in here that just applying those acts written a hundred years ago are going to be useful because no, what's going to replace, I mean, Google acting naughty is one thing, but like, oh, how, are you gonna, how are you going to replace like your Google's software platform and everything you do or Amazon's shopping experience and so forth? Yeah, I agree with you. But my position on this is I thought it was really interesting. Hopefully you will agree to come back on the show. Don't know. Um, I've upset some of his friends, but there we go. Um, but I always listen and always read his posts. Um, the only thing I think Google and some of the other technology, you know, like Amazon, I think they've got deep connections with the um, defence establishment and the and the surveillance apparatus that runs this country. Um, it's um, They've got deep um, connections, and um, because of those deep connections, they've been allowed to get away with a lot more than um, other companies probably would be, even in the tech um, area. But I, I might be talking dribble. What do you reckon? Who should I go? Who should I go? Let's go, Vito. What do you reckon, Vito? I think it's it's uh, at this point it's uh, pretty uh, impossible to just get. Google out of our system. It's like, like uh, Spencer said, we're so intertwined. Our lives are so intertwined with what they're already doing. Um, there was a, ni- a nice kind of um, mention here in the article about the fact that it's, uh, uh, the competition is just one click away. So how can they be a monopoly if the, the competition is there and it's really easy to find? But, uh, uh, but in, co- in connection to what you said, Jonathan, uh, when a company gets to this kind of scale, and uh, and and starts working within like behind the curtain, if you will, you know, working with the governments, with the kind of uh, uh, with other huge corporations, without being kind of transparent to the public, to the users. Uh, that's when things start to smell. And I think that this is what we people have started to realize in the past couple of years. Not only from Google, Facebook has been getting a lot of hits on 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 pretty similar uh, subjects. The co- uh, the cockroaches of the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they, they took over, you know, like when we started building websites and, you know, uh, 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 working on online, none of them existed. And it's insane that this happened in just like 15, uh, 15 years. Um, yeah, so I think, I don't know how they're going to do it. I'm sure that if they're just going to put the foot down, like governments and regulations can get them to do whatever they need. Um, but it's not going to be easy at all, you know, to just get not only Google on board, but the users that are already used to this uh, a free kind of experience of getting everything in a click of a button. Yeah, I really see it as a kind of quasar-fascism. It's, corp- like, it's corporations working with state, something you saw in Italy. It has all the taste of quasar-fascism to me. What do you reckon, John? Okay, so there is an antitrust. I don't know what this particular antitrust case is. There has been uh, three cases of the European Union versus Google uh, related to you know Google Shopping and Android and some other things. Yelp has an antitrust uh, lawsuit against Google because I guess they don't display Pushing enough down. Yelp. Even you know, the funny part is, is like if you if you look at Google results, and this might be intentional, but for any local SEO search, like Yelp is 
you know, position number one, sometimes position number two and three. So that doesn't make any sense. But there's also another antitrust suit uh, against them by TripAdvisor. Um, so like the, the hotel booking, that, that might be part of this too. I know that... that um, well, maybe they, I'll be, you know, after you name those particular companies, maybe I'll be unfair to Google because they, you know, they're, they're yeah, it's sour great. using Google. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, and, and, I, they, and they did launch something very recently, Google Flights. So I think all these people that, all these businesses that are middlemen, uh, between you know, hotel booking or flight booking or, or whatever it is, or, or Yelp, you know, trying to get advertising dollars. They're in overdrive right now uh, with the sales calls, um, you know, trying to get revenue because they're not hitting their targets either. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's part of this. Now, something that I saw uh, yesterday, late afternoon, it, it wasn't until like later afternoon that I saw it, but apparently there's going to be uh, something rolling out over the next uh, few days in the, in the Google algorithm called a diversity um, aspect. So instead of having a bunch of results with just one page uh, in certain results, kind of like what I was saying before, where, where some results, it's like, you know, five Yelp landing pages, uh, they're, they're going to try and mix it up and, and have that first page have like more uh, results from different websites yeah so i don't know but to, to your earlier point google and any yeah no, google and any of these companies google, that. yeah google facebook youtube all these companies do not want to be regulated though they probably all should their results. Sorry to interrupt. yeah they probably they, should i thought all their results were all this anyway it was all done by they, they don't need yeah to make sure no there's always layers yeah Anyway, uh, I mean, yeah. you know, it comes down to the end results of the users because the things we talk about, like, I want to bring in another thing which is unrelated but sort of suspiciously on point. That concept of the mysterious, how did I get ad retargeted for things inside my home? We talked about it several weeks ago about, like, is it my Alexa that's leaking it or my Siri or is it my browser? I read a story which actually I think is the source of this, and that leads to a conclusion about how connected we are through multiple parties. I had indicated that in my house, there's a joke that my friends who come over to play in band would, would like say things about buying suppositories or something. So that later in my browser would show up the thing. Now, in this case, I got an email from my son's mom, that something about a thyroid test that she was worried about, that she went to a testing lab. It had nothing to do with me. I never typed, look for it. I just read it in her text message that comes through my computer via the, the iMessage. I read an article that indicated that ISPs including Comcast, are selling the data flow of their actual subscribers to ad retargeting services, which theoretically somebody like a Facebook could access the data. So in other words, what is happening, which is not really so mysterious or, you know, like a conspiracy theory, is that it's not the browser you're using, it's not the phone you're using, it's not even the device you're using, but it could be your internet connection itself where the data wow. flow is basically going through a filter, collecting the profile of what your particular preferences are and the uses. Because I actually screenshotted this. This is the third time this has happened, and it's kind of a scary joke, although the conclusion is still the same thing, which is if I'm not living in a cave in Afghanistan or not disconnected from anything communication-wise, I just have to assume that everything I think and say and do is being collected or used by somebody to market to me. And that gets right back to Morton's original agreement from months ago, which is as long as consumers seek to trade their privacy and the data about themselves in exchange for offers of some kind, it probably doesn't matter whether it's Google or Facebook or this company or that company. We're going to always pick the stupidest decision like people who fly Ryanair for $4 and then complain why they're treated like cattle and stuff. It's because you paid $4 and now they're going to think they can put you under the airplane and it'll be just fine. Stop mm -hmm. saying yes to that and they won't. Same with Google. I suppose the answer to this lies in if everybody went over to Gabriel Weinberg's DuckDuckGo, Google would have to find a different way to get attention because they couldn't sell the ad space and so forth. And I think that's just, you know, sheeple kind yeah, of argument. Uh, yeah, if I see your point. Yeah. Well, let's go for our break, folks. We've got some more good stories. Uh, um, and we've got to seem to have a small but opinionated panel. So everything's good, isn't it, viewers? This is why you, you listen to this show, isn't it? Uh, we'll be back in a few moments, folks. 
We're coming back. I don't think I'm on Yost's Christmas card list. Something tells me. <laughs> I don't think don't think he likes me. It's there, um, there we go. I lo- I love you, Yost. I don't you don't dub you the arm, you know. You know <laughs> you and Yost get you and uh James Farmer and Yost together at a cocktail party. I think I would like to have a video camera on that. That'd be guys, funny, uh, he's he's just trying to get invited to the SEO Oktoberfest. That's what I, I just want to go to. It. I've, I've missed that out, mate. Uh, you know, I never went to parties like that. Groucho <laughs> <laughs> Marks. Of- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm too old now. I've missed all the fun. I'm lucky if I can keep myself up late at night, finishing off a client job. Uh, um, <laughs> I've got to pump myself. Literally, I take a syringe and I just pump coffee into myself, you know, just to keep myself going. Uh, um, right, on to the next story. <laughs> Building the most accessible site possible with the perfect lighthouse score. Oh my God. Um, the couple this, of these two, by the way, I can offer a suggestion. This story and the next story are basically the same point, probably. The Google well, Ads yeah. desktop mobile selector, which yeah. is this is like watching paint dry story, but the, the real point is stop paying attention to any of the bullshit tests that Google is throwing at your face to improve your client's page scores. They are so wrong and so not to any logical purpose at all, other than to literally spend days and weeks and months worrying over something that your clients freak out about because somebody told them some bad information, but that no user, this tool, this lighthouse was about trying to make your accessibility better, except the point of the story was when you try to get to 100, you end up with a page that looks like it was from 1992 that's in black and white with green text, like it's on a like a, an old... Well, that's it's always been that way, isn't yeah. it? It's oh been, that's one of the main reasons why accessibility... Uh, but I, seriously, I, I do wish would pr- somehow, some way we could get to somewhere where the that the majority of WordPress sites or well, some of the themes could get a, a something where the situation was a little bit better and it wasn't filled with this garbage, which I agree with you, Spencer. It it kind of but it, and in the, in a perverted way it, it goes against the real um the you know the real thing of you know, making something that's, especially when it's a large company or medium-sized company, you know, for God's sake, it's 2019. You think you could do something that was accessible, that was reasonably accessible to people that got vision problems or other disabilities. You would have thought it, wouldn't you, Spencer? But somehow it's just ended up being a heap of crap, really, hasn't it, Spencer? Well, uh, my point is that accessibility should be paramount. However... There are times when accessibility might be an alternative road into the same data or the same information. And it has little to do with making your main website please Google for all of its other reasons. So this was an example. Unfortunately, the Lighthouse one was about accessibility, but his conclusion, I think, was similar to the why Google tools for getting page score are just stupid, is that the end users of your business, the pr- let's say the primary gateway with the stairs, right, up to the courthouse steps, the main staircase should be designed for people based upon what's the best result for your customers or your the people you're solving your pain for. Not because some Google page scores arbitrary bullshit. The lighthouse thing on accessibility is indicative of like, well, we built this courthouse in 1890. So what we have to do is right next to the staircase, build a really easy to use ramp or an elevator to accommodate those people equally and fairly. But we don't need to make the staircase into a ramp. We leave the staircase a staircase and the ramp a ramp and they both get into the courthouse so everybody has the fair access. That doesn't mean that you have these stupid tools that tell you to follow blindly to build, you know, a a ramp that looks like a roller coaster uh, loop-de-loop and to build a staircase that looks like some kind of, you know, modern artwork. Because that's what's happening when people get freaked out about Google tests or this light out test. Instead of just talking to the end users, which is even I think for accessibility, a great suggestion like, Talk to the community of people that are hearing or vision impaired or, or typing impaired or color impaired and say, what would help you the most? And let's do that stuff for our business, not like just some tests. What do you reckon, Peter? 
Um, first of all, I agree with Spencer once again. Um, I think that in terms of accessibility, well, originally I'm from Israel, and over there there is a law uh, that happened that uh, like uh, uh, came out about six years ago that every website that ge- that uh, for a business that generates more than uh, I think in in US dollars is like thirty thousand dollars per year, which is really low. Um, has to have accessibility built into the website. So then a lot of tools have popped, uh, popped on, you know, like with uh, um, fixing, fixing like the brightness and, uh, and making the fonts bigger and doing all of this kind of stuff that, that uh, like you said, makes your website look like it was built on GeoCities uh, back in the 90s. Um, but, uh, uh, but the cool thing is that it's optional. So it really correlates to what you said. So... The website is designed to serve the, cust- the, the exact target audience, not everyone. You know, you can never please everyone and you shouldn't. You need to know who your audience is and focus on them. And then have that additional ramp on the side or that additional sidebar, if we're talking inside the website, that allows people with disabilities to make the website accessible specifically for them based on the needs that they need specifically right now and not everything. Uh, so... I'm not even going to look into this tool uh, because I can't see it being applied into any of the websites that I've built over the years. Well, before I throw it over to John, I I see now, and I think it's an excellent point. Thanks for that. Um, It's what you're both saying is that fundamentally this idea that you can produce an all all sinning, all applying website is just a fantasy but on the other hand after you built your main website then you could look at a, if yeah. a kind of secondary website or or somehow it can be then produced to somebody that has got a, a certain disability but the idea you can build the whole thing yeah i, I probably agree that was great i'll add your point you're a great sponsor jack arturo wp fusion allows us to build a custom journey based upon a person's being tagged in the CRM synchronized up of their particular preferences. You can have a person with various disabilities be tagged by their own selections as to which things they would like to see. And WP Fusion makes this dead bang simple to adjust the actual WordPress ecosystem to suit them. The fonts could be made larger, the contrast could be greater, the colors could go away, the scrolling could be simpler. All those factors could be done with marketing automation using WP Fusion and the core WordPress stuff and also synchronize it so that the emails that you send out marketing wise would suit. You know, if people can't watch videos or something, you only send them. And that makes that journey so personal to the user. But at the same time, it's accommodating individuals by their own choice for whatever things help them to access your content. As Vito Riley points out, it's kind of, we're saying the same thing, is that mandating that you accommodate everybody for every reason as a a primary thing is just suicide for businesses. And it's what's wrong with the EU. I throw that other article in there about the GDPR and like, you know, it's my tip of the week. It's like GDPR and cookie law and VAT tax and God forbid Brexit and this and that. I don't know how anybody gets out of bed in the morning in Europe but in America and Israel and other progressive areas, like they at least apply laws based upon, hey, capitalism first, and then yeah. we'll figure out how to make everything fair. All right, all right. Uh, I'm tempted to go somewhere there, but I'm not going to do it, actually. I'm in a, I'm in a bit. So, John, what do you reckon? Yeah, so, and, and like I said, I'll talk more about it at the end of the show. My tip of the week will be uh, an accessibility tool that I actually use. Um, when I'm checking accessibility, this was an eye-opening article uh, that that Lighthouse really doesn't read uh, accessibility all that well. It's it's kind of like when people look at their page speed score in Google, and you know they take that as is the gospel uh, truth. It, it isn't everything. You need to look at things in in with human eyes and and kind of judge things for yourself. Um, you know, but. To go back to to something that I've heard a a million times before, the web is accessible by default. It's when we add all this crazy stuff to it that it makes it inaccessible. Uh, There's a tweet that I saw yesterday by Megan Fisher uh, Caldwell, Owl-tastic, somebody that I used to follow like uh, when I was first first in design. Uh, And she said, designers today are 
what if the links slowly form a pentagram and the button dissolves into TV static? <laughs> and as you scroll, it is swallowed by a black abyss. And I'm like, okay, but hear me out. What if instead we have a headline, some body copy, and a button? I think that, that designers overall, and, and especially some of the designers that I've worked with in the past, it, it's kind of like they, they feel the need to prove their designer worthiness. And so everything like fades in and scrolls up and from the side and all this stuff and, uh, you know, just all kinds of like gimmicky stuff, which is, it's fine, but, you know, don't do it at the, at the cost of uh, accessibility and don't do it at the cost of, of actually accomplishing uh, whatever the mission of that, you know, website is. I, I, I understand where designers, I think, I think they rot in their brains in the end because after listening to the 20th client say, it doesn't pop, it's just not popping for me. <laughs> uh, Rob, I think it rots their brains in the end, John, and that's why... <laughs> That's what to defend them. Because I think after hearing that for the 50th time, it's not popping to me. Well, please explain why it's, I can't, you're the designer, you're the person that's supposed to make it pop for me. Uh, um, <laughs> that's what I reckon. I think they just rot in the heart, really. It's a tough game. Bud? Have a drink of water. Bud? Drink of water. You sound like you're going to choke there. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know... I've had a few people say to that me lately, it's not popping for me. And I just thought, well, why boot up your ass? Why make you pop? <laughs> <laughs> but there we go. Uh, um, that's, oh, Jesus. Uh, um, on to the next one. Google Ads, new desktop mobile selector. Who, who, who found these stories? Oh, that was we tied we tied that one in. It's the same story, just for the like. <laughs> John, let John start. You started every freaking story. <laughs> story so. selector went on vacation this week or something. All right, this this sorry, listeners and viewers. Google Ads. New, I'm trying to keep Uncle Spencer under control, but there we go. Um, Google Ads new desktop mobile selected to the rich result testing tool. God, what a headline! What is this about, John? Your mute. Okay, so there's a rich, there's like, uh, Google has a bunch of tools that, that are somewhat useful. Um, you know, mobile friendly test, structured data test. This one is a rich results test. So basically it's checking if your page could have rich snippets. And it doesn't mean that you're going to get it. It just means that it could get it. If, if you happen to get to page one. Then, then you could get red snippets. It doesn't and, mean that. And if you buy AMP, and if you're also a Google Premier yeah, advertiser, and also if you've registered your business on Google Business Maps, and also if you this and that, and then when you're done, it has, as you know, absolutely nothing to do with ever seeing the light of page one, two, three, or five, unless you're actually paying a lot of money for advertising at the same time, which makes this whole thing into a kids cover your ears, a circle jerk around Google, <laughs> essentially for any business owner who buys into any of it, because the ones who are killing it, making the money, and sorry, John, I stole your moment there, but is the ones oh, who are making awesome. the money are the ones who go right to the, the customers, figure out what pain they have, where they are, and they just talk to the customers without trying to be found organically anymore, which is such a fool's errand, it seems. Oh, you know, you just write, you just write stuff at a target audience, you know, and you just make make sure it's reasonably good stuff. You can't keep worrying about, you know, I, 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 I think it's got to the stage that Google has become such a bureaucracy that you've got competing departments producing stuff, and I, I, I wonder in the end if there's anybody with any kind of strategy or it's just thrown to the wall isn't it and say if some poor smuck will believe this crap you know uh, um i don't know maybe i'll be totally cynical here Vito, what do you reckon I, th I think they have the privilege of of testing a bunch of different products and different kind of uh, uh options for their users uh, which i uh, you know i wish i would have you know the ability to launch so many things and have 95 percent of them fail just to have 5% really blow up. Uh, so, um, so, so 
I, I get that, you know, I, I don't run and, and check everything that they do. Um, but if something comes, comes on from all kinds of different angles, then I'll dive in and I'll see what I can uh, uh, benefit out of this new tool or this new kind of process. And with, with this one, I'm, again, I'm not seeing myself changing my workflow around, uh, around getting uh, rich, uh, uh, rich snippets there. But, uh, but it is good to know um, once you're already on the top, uh, 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 on the top kind of uh, 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 of the search page, then starting to see what you can do to optimize it, what you can do to kind of like get more out of this thing. I couldn't agree more with Spencer that uh, that it's all about the offer. You're agreeing too much with Uncle Spencer. Uh, yeah. Because we're on one side, you know? That's our side. No, you just agree with me. <laughs> I agree with the oh, right we're position. We're missing, we're missing <laughs> Sally and Moulton. They always have good... Head banning sessions with Spencer. I want, I, want to, I want to throw an old man get off my lawn story into this. And <laughs> being, I grew up in the 70s and so forth. So it's funny because in the 70s, we didn't have many of the technologies that even my kids, 8 to 18, take for granted. And so to amuse ourselves with technology, we had things, for example, like rotary dial telephones. Right. When my parents would go out at night, they went out. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't know where they were when they were coming home. I mean, it was just the, the TV stopped working at 11 o'clock at night and a test pattern came on. And there was this thing called CB radio, which when I was like 10 or 11 was really cool because like I could get on the CB and talk to like other people that had these big antennas on their house. I was like, oh, we're all talking. But what's so funny is flash forward to this recently. It was last, last year, a couple years ago. They had a YouTube video that was a bunch of kids you know, my kids age, teenagers, 11, 12, 13, and they took a common rotary dial telephone and they connected to the, you know, at t it still works. They gave the kids a bounty. They said, we'll give you like a hundred bucks if you can figure out how to call your friend <laughs> on this rotary dial telephone. And none of the kids could do it. They couldn't figure out that you had to pick it up first. Then you had to turn the numbers. You had to let it go. My point is you take a look at what was like commonplace, like the whiz bang thing of 1970 something that we needed because there was dead space. Otherwise you flash forward today. My God, it's laughable. Like my kids can't write in cursive. They couldn't dial a rotary dial telephone. This bullshit from Google only matters today at this moment because we're on the way to AI talking things or brain implants or visual, you know, holograms, all this website like does your web browser do this or that or is it accessible or not it's like it's going to be gone tomorrow and we're going to have jokes about remember when we were worried about what color our website was and we had a computer monitor from apple that sold for five thousand dollars plus thousand dollars more for the stand ha 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 and, <laughs> hello like i think the whole point is don't worry about it because the one continuous thing that has not changed since forever it's since the cavemen days there's been people that hunt and people that gather and people that sell and people that organize. And we will continue to have relationships with people as long as we're here. And that's the immutable fact about why focusing on your clients and the relationship matters more than the tools of the technique. There we go. All right. We're going to go for our recommendations and choices. I'm, I don't normally allow this, but I'm going to allow Vito to plug his own, his own product because they're um, so... Your recommendations, obviously, it's got to be your own. Yeah, well, it's the first time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna self promote shamelessly. Yeah, shamelessly, but uh, <laughs> uh, unlike Spencer, who continues to do that, uh, I, I, <laughs> right? Uh, um, I'm only, so tell us about your product. Sure. So um, I'm just gonna start with a bit of background, really quickly. So I basically started uh, building websites from the back of a van. Uh, while I was touring the world with the band that I had at the time. Yes, and, I, I looked at some of your old band. Very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. That, so that, that was kind of the dream back then, you know, and, and we did pretty well, you know, we played to, uh, we started with like a few dozen people in the crowd and we went all the way up to thousands. They uh, seemed, they seemed a, nice, a nice group of boys and girls. Sorry? They, they seemed a nice group of boys and girls. Yeah. No, no girls instead, unless they are, uh, you know, you, you can't see them in the pictures, but they were there. Yeah, right. um, but <laughs> uh, but to, after the battle, like, you, you've, you've been to some of Yoast parties, haven't you? To Yoast parties? Actually, no, I haven't, I haven't no. yet. 
Oh, I'm going to World Camp Europe uh, next week, so... Oh, uh, well, uh, you probably bump into him and give him, a, yeah, give him sure. my best regards. It's in Germany, so for the, gotta, the gotta Oh, be. yeah, it probably will be. Uh, um, yeah. You've got something to look forward to. Sorry, I interrupt. Sorry. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So that's when uh, oh, that's where I started. Uh, I started just building sites from the back of the van because the band was doing well, but we we were all still kind of really broke. Uh, and uh, once the band broke up, I started looking into how can I scale this thing. What can I do to take this to the next level? And within the first year, I grew from a freelancer to an agency, and I, I broke like the six figure mark in the first year. Uh, by year three, I had twelve guys on my team, and we're fully functional agency here in London, uh, in, uh, in, in the UK. Um, and during, while managing multiple projects and trying to work with all of these clients at the same time, uh, having the team learn processes and all of these things, it always came down to client communications. And this was the biggest uh, problem that we had within my agency. Um, getting the content, approving designs, and basically providing support on an ongoing basis uh, with with the client actually giving you the content and the information that you need to, to, um, to solve their problem. And so that's how basically WP Feedback was born. Uh, the idea with WP Feedback, it's kind of like uh, an Envision app, but built into your client's website. So you install that on the, pla- on the website, and then they can, have, they can literally click any element within the site, and it creates a little sticker with a comment and sends you off a notification. Now, instead of you going into the website and starting to look for the problem or trying to figure out what the client was talking about in the, in the forward the email that they sent you, you click the notification, you've been redirected to the exact location where it scrolls down and opens so you can keep communicating with knowledge. It also uh, collects like the screen size, the browser, uh, it binds it to the exact div. So it works on mobile. The client can give a comment on his phone, but you can see it on the computer in the exact location where the problem happened. And the idea is to just save as much time as possible in client communications. Um, right now, we, start, we, we launched the beta two months ago and it was amazing. Uh, we got, uh, I thought it's going to take like uh, at least a full month to get to the first 100 users out of nowhere. You know, I never, I never took a, a product to market within the WordPress uh, space. And, um, um, but within 10 hours, we had our first 100 users and we kept collecting people that wanted to learn about the product. Uh, by the end of the month, we had 1,000. And uh, now we just launched the founding members um, a kind of deal last week. And uh, that's still in progress until Tuesday. So that's the right time to go for it and to see what's going on there. Uh, it allows people to save up to 70% off of the market price that will happen. We're launching uh, next to uh, WordCamp Europe as I'm going there. Uh, so now is the right time to check it out, wpfeedback.co. And if you want to even skip that opt-in, I'll give like a little tip here on, uh, on, the, uh, on the live webinar. It's wpfeedback.co forward slash founding dash members. Yeah, such an expert job. Uh, I'm very impressed. But I actually looked a cool product and you were recommended by old Lee, so I thought, and you got opinions. You have to come back to the show. You, uh, I would love to push Right. Um, Oh, oh, Spencer, what are you, what, what is your recommendation? Uh, first of all, I love Vito's product. Vito shared it with me about a month ago when it came out and I, I felt like it's a perfect example of what we're talking about, right? You know, I get the benefit of working with a lot of different authors, including mm-hmm. Jack, but Vito brought this to me and I said like, look, it's fantastic. Just figure out who it's for, what are the benefits, <laughs> not the features, And it'll be a hit. And I think it's already demonstrating that because when you really deal with what people's pain points are, they will just make it very clear to you what it is that they want you to do. And then the rest is downhill. So in light of my sarcasm about GDPR, I found one called shipyourenemiesgdpr.com, which is basically like the thing you can do if you really are pissed off and you know somebody who happens to be in the EU, effectively follow the letter of the law and send them a GDPR access request designed to waste as much of their time as possible oh my God. because they're legally required to respond to your request in 30 days. 
Jonathan, I will need your email address, please. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do, uh, Rob. I'm based in the, the free USA. So if I, any European client wants to waste my time. It became right. a nightmare here on, on this side of the world. Uh, last year, when, when it came about, uh, it was like, first of all, no one knew what was really going on for months and months until, uh, until it kind of cleared out. I think that there's still a lot of uh, false information out there when it comes to GDPR. And it's just not really enforceable to that same level as they want it to be. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, before people start getting sued for 20 million euros, which is what the, the amount that we're talking about here, uh, which <laughs> is insane in its own, you know? Uh, so before people start getting sued, they're just going to do like a, little, a few other clauses to soften it a little bit or at least consider small to medium businesses uh, that can't afford $20 million fi uh, euro fine. <laughs> where, yeah, Crazy. Where <laughs> Make sure it's in the Slack on that, Spencer. Yeah, it's in there. I'll, I'll be testing it later. <laughs> oh, Which, by the way, I want to just point out, like, these are the examples of the things when you can look at all the Brexit stuff, but, like, when you hold a mirror up to the ridiculousness of things like VAT and the cookie law and GDPR and Brexit and all that, don't even, I mean, we have our problems here, of course. You can do that all day long. I'm just simply saying, like, from the standpoint of who is trying to benefit for whom there it's clear that there's nothing to do with benefiting the actual business community in any way, nor is it really protecting any consumer because this can be used just as well for a tool of destruction as it is for benefit. And there's no, like, who's going to enforce it anyway. So. There we go. I see a lot of uh, lawyers starting to, um, uh, you're a lawyer yourself, Spencer, right? Well, retired, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. Retired. See, we talked about that when it came to that DNA evidence a while back where it could be a whole business of like, is that my spit on the beer or not? You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, exactly. there, we go. there we go. Lawyers will never be, they'll always be with us. <laughs> even after the bomb, even after the bomb, you know, cockroaches and lawyers will be with us. Uh, Rob, there we go. Uh, Rob, John, um, what, what, what would you like to bring to the attention to the listeners and viewers? <clears throat> yeah. So we were talking earlier about the Google lighthouse tool. Uh, but what I wanted to to share, and it's in Slack, is uh, it's wave.webaim.org. And this is the Wave Accessibility Evaluation Tool. You can pop in a URL there, and it will, will give you an assessment of uh, errors and warnings for accessibility. And it will show you, like, in the page uh, what things are... Uh, causing the errors it, it will point them out like in the page so definitely something uh, to check out I've used it plenty of times uh, there's another tool out there um, and I, I can't seem to find the URL uh, but I've used it in the past uh, to, for a colorblind test uh, a similar thing uh, <coughs> and put that in uh, the slack channel as well that's great and my one folks is essential add-ons for animator um, they're doing an AppSumo deal at the present moment. I think you've got a month before that disappears. And if, you cough, if you're a member of AppSumo, you cough up $70. They're doing one for 39 and then I think it's like 70 plus a little bit. You can get lifetime updates and you can use it on unlimited websites. So it's a cracking deal and you get uh, over 100 add-ons for your animator page builder uh, um super fun that would keep you busy busy beaver well yeah well, but i use both yeah. i use animator and beaver builder i don't you've got to keep yourself multi-functional haven't you somehow i don't know all right then um i think it's been a great show i'm going to let my panel um tell you how you can find more about them so spencer how can people find out more about you and what you're up to <laughs> If you have any questions about marketing automation, membership, e-commerce, and so forth, you can reach me for a free call at WPLaunchify.com. You can also check out a bunch of free videos on the same point and YouTube at WPLaunchify. There you go. How can you resist it, listeners of viewers? A free call with free call. Spencer. There we, we go. Stuff all day. There we are. You know, do what he plans to be. Keep reading him with questions. I use, and I will use There's my computer that I brought with me in my 1970s time machine, this new computer I've got. <laughs> He's going to send me European things. Send him some calls, folks. Um, John, um, how can people find out more about you, what you're up to? 
Definitely. You can, uh, you, you can follow my exploits over at LockdownSEO.com. You can also check me out on my YouTube uh, channel where I post daily videos on SEO. Uh, just go to YouTube and search hashtag LockdownSEO. You'll find me. Yeah, but it's been doing well. I, I watched some of it myself. Yeah, it's um, been picking up. I'm telling you. Beto, how can people find out more about you, your band, your music, your views? What are you up to? Well, the band doesn't exist anymore, but you can oh, still check it out uh, on Spotify. It was called Chase the Ace, uh, which is, I don't know if it's for everyone, but it was, we, were, we were pretty good in my mind, at least. And, uh, and, uh, and then we have WPFeedback.co. That's the brand new plugin. Um, we're currently running the founding members promotion. So now is, the great, is a great time to join us. There is a lifetime deal that will not come back as we approach the market. So WPFeedback.co. That's great. We'll see you next week. When we're, <clears throat> we'll see you next week when we're, hopefully we have a great panel, a great discussion. And we just take a slightly lighter view of the WordPress and the web in general. Uh, we'll next, see you next, next week, folks. Next but, week we will all apologize to all the team of Automata. We <laughs> For the first conversation. Yeah.